you can do tomorrow to raise your game, as well as those sleep hacks to really dig into this topic if you're already familiar with it. Okay, hope you enjoy. Dr. Amy Bender is a MyTax postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Calgary, Faculty of Kinesiology, and works jointly at the Center for Sleep and Human Performance as a sleep scientist. She received her PhD and Master of Science degrees in Experimental Psychology from Washington State University in Spokane, Washington, specializing in sleep EEG. Her current research focuses on the relationship of sleep and recovery on athletic performance in Canadian national team athletes. She has developed sleep intervention protocols for numerous Canadian national teams and is working towards validating the athlete sleep screening questionnaire in over 200 Canadian national team athletes. Her research interests stem from being an athlete herself. She's a Hall of Fame basketball player, a mountaineer, and completed an Ironman in 20, uh, rather 2009. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Amy, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this area of sleep research. Yeah, so I uh, started off as actually a sleep technologist. So I started working at Washington State University um, at a sleep deprivation lab, uh, or sleep research lab, focusing on the effects of sleep deprivation on cognitive function, and helped helped out there basically in charge of anything related to the sleep recording, so training research assistants, um, scoring the sleep studies, those kind of things, analyzing the EEG, and also one of my jobs was to help sleep-deprived subjects for over 62 hours sleep deprivation period. Wow. So that was <laughs> What was that like? <laughs> it was pretty interesting. Um, I would work on the night, so basically they would miss two nights of sleep, so I would work on that second night. We would hook them up with electrodes about an hour before bedtime and try and keep them, in a, keep them awake during that process and um, get to actually put them to bed and turn out the lights and boom, I would be able to see what's going on with their sleep and wow. literally some participants would take 10 seconds to fall asleep. It was very interesting. And what kind of things were you finding then with the uh, sleep deprivation? Obviously, we know it's not good for cognition, but can you give us some more details on uh, what you guys were finding? Yeah, so surprisingly, um, you know, obviously it's not good for mood. It's not good for decision making. So we found that participants would make more risks. So they'd have more risky decision making behaviors. Uh, Their reaction time would slow, as I mentioned, the mood. So they would have impairments in their mood was one of the first things that we would see. Um, But there's also a circadian effect. So um, sleep is regulated by both the homeostatic process, which basically means the longer you've been awake, the more likelihood you'll want to sleep. And the opposite, you know, when you first wake up, you don't have a very high propensity for sleep. But during those studies, we would also see the circadian factors, which is independent of sleep-wake activity. So we would see alertness fluctuations throughout the day, regardless, you know, if they're 59 hours sleep deprived, they may be more alert than when they were, you know, 30 hours sleep deprived. It just depended on the timing of day, which is something I didn't know going into that. Yeah, that's really interesting. And for people who are listening at home, uh, this idea of uh, circadian rhythms is effectively, you know, the hormonal output of the body first thing in the morning, uh, and the, as the hormones production uh, shifts over a 24-hour period, and, and even internally in terms of all of our cells sort of run on that 24-hour clock. Um, now, it's interesting you mentioned risky behavior or um, you know slower cognitive function because I think a lot of people. I work downtown Toronto, and you know a lot of people aren't getting as much sleep as we'd like them to, um, and rely on a lot of caffeine, etc. So, is there a um, a number in terms of total sleep that you guys were looking for? or, or So generally, the recommendation from the National Sleep Foundation and sleep um, bodies is for a normal uh, or for a human is to get between seven and nine hours for an adult. Uh, if you're a teenager, it's more like eight to ten. So there is a range in the amount of sleep um, per individual. And there's uh, age, 
age effects as well. So the younger you are, the more sleep that you need. Um, but in terms of a healthy, normal sleep range, it's between seven and nine hours. Gotcha. And that idea around circadian rhythms that when we get up in the morning and the time we go down for sleep, um, you know, any insights in there in terms of what you guys saw with, uh, you know, is maintaining the same wake time and sleeping time generally the best practice or what types of observations? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so we know that timing also has an impact on the quality of sleep that we're getting. So if you're more of a night owl, you know, and your schedule permits you, it would be advisable to go to sleep later and wake up later. If you're an earlier bird, you know, try to go to sleep earlier and wake up earlier. But a lot of times there's disadvantage for the night owls because of the fact that they have to get up for work and those kind of things. So there's um, a mismatch between their internal rhythm and their schedule their work schedule, let's say, and we call that social jet lag. So there's kind of a mismatch between internal and what you're required to do. I think that's a um, big problem these days as well, because we've got a lot of people who, yes, yeah, stay up later to get the job done, because obviously there's potentially fewer distractions for a lot of people in the evening. Um, but like you said, I mean, they're getting up in the morning, they've got to get the job done. So overall, the sleep quantity is going to really decline. Um, so any... Mm -hmm. Any suggestions there? Is it better to, uh, you know, for that type of person to, to just get up earlier and, and, and get the work done there? Or if they had the perfect, if they could control everything just to wake up later, like you mentioned, and start work later? Yeah, so a lot of times we'll see extreme evening types. I, I wouldn't say a lot of times, but some of the time we'll see extreme evening types in athletes, which can be counterproductive depending on their training times. So uh, light is actually one of the, the biggest zeitgeibers or it has the most effect on our circadian rhythm. So in some of your listeners who are more of those evening types that do need to get up early for work, we would recommend getting light exposure as soon as you can early in the morning upon awakening. And a lot of time in the winter, that's very difficult to do. So we would recommend a light therapy box. Um, use it for 20 minutes. And then that helps set your circadian rhythm to the time that you need to you know, perform and, and be up for work. That's terrific. I mean, I think that's great advice, especially for people who, you know, again, living in Canada, if we get true winter climate, so the sun doesn't show its face until later in the morning so that's a, that's a great strategy now if people get even out you know even if it's a cloudy day uh, is that external light you know enough to kind of help reset those rhythms as well let's say they get outside at 7 30 and the sun's out even though it's cloudy in the winter yeah um cloudy cloudy if you look at the lux levels of let's say a sunny day versus a cloudy day um and you compare that to indoor light levels, even on a cloudy day, you're getting way more exposure than if, you, if you're if you just using your normal overhead lights. Um, but I think the key here is uh, the timing of it. So, so currently in the winter, you know, our sun doesn't rise until, I, I'm not sure exactly what the time, but you know, 7.30, 8 a.m. where I'm at. Um, and so for someone who needs to be to work at 8 a.m., you would definitely you can't rely on just the natural light, like light, dark cycle. You would want to have that light box to to be able to use when you first wake up. Gotcha. The other important thing uh, with that is you want to block light in the evening. So a lot of the athletes that we see, and a lot of just the general population, they use electronic devices right before bedtime, and that light is actually telling our brain to wake up and is kind of further perpetuating the problem to be delayed. So studies have shown that um, if you have uh, iPad exposure, let's say an hour before bedtime, versus a paper book, you're just reading from a paper book, they found that with the iPad, because of that light, um, you wake up more often during the night, your your circadian rhythm is delayed, so your melatonin gets delayed, it takes you longer to fall asleep, and it can really impact your sleep quality. Yeah, so that's... Blocking light in the evening is important. 
that's a big uh, topic, especially you know for the average folk and you know us at Canada Basketball, our younger athletes are tweeting and Instagramming and Facebooking, you know, in the hours before bed. So it can definitely be uh, something that contributes to that light exposure for sure. Um, now, before we dive into the athlete side of things, any uh, for that light box in the morning, is there a specific uh, product or, you know, is using your iPad in the morning a proxy for some of these products? What would you suggest? Uh, I think you can, I mean, you can purchase, there's a variety of different kinds of light boxes. What you want to look for is something very bright. So, um, so if you're using an actual light box, a lot of those that we would recommend would be at least 10,000 lux. But if you're using more of the light, uh, light glasses, you wouldn't need as strong of a, a stimulus because it's closer to your eyes. So one of the ones we use, um, Luminette glasses, I think they're around 1,000 lux. So it's much less, but it's a lot closer to your eye. Um, so they don't need to be as strong. Gotcha. Terrific. Well, why don't we shift gears and uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing with some of the athletes here in Canada and uh, some of the findings that you guys are uh, are seeing. Yeah, so we're, we're um, basically one of the main projects we're working on right now is to validate an athlete's sleep screening questionnaire. And what we're doing is we're we've screened over 200 Canadian national team athletes and we're looking at the amount of sleep that they're reporting, how long it takes them to fall asleep, are they more an evening type, um, those kind of things. And then comparing that to what uh, objective sleep looks like using a sleep watch or an actigraph. And we're also comparing their results to what our sleep medicine physician thinks as well. And so what we're hoping to find is that this uh, questionnaire, this tool will be useful at not having to use some of these more expensive measures, but the tool will be able to capture athletes who are really struggling with their sleep and for us to be able to flag those athletes and be able to get them help when they need it. Uh, We're also working with different teams and doing sleep intervention protocols with different teams. So we're looking at their sleep at baseline, using the sleep watches to see how much sleep they're getting, how long it's taking them to fall asleep. And then we're incorporating sleep intervention. And so we know the athletes don't get as much sleep as they probably should. so So we encourage them to try and get at least maybe 30 minutes more of sleep per night. We also know napping is very important for athletes, and so a lot of the athletes, I'd say probably 50% don't nap at all, so trying to encourage napping, more napping activity. And then the third intervention that we use is uh, blocking blue light at night. So there's uh, glasses that you can buy that can block out 99% of blue light. And I try and use these myself as much as I can in the two hours before bedtime. And I just notice a huge difference in my levels of alertness. I feel sleepy, I start yawning. Um, you know, there's times when you can't necessarily put away the electronic devices if you have uh, something, a work deadline and those kind of things. And so having the glasses helps to mitigate the impact of blue light. That's definitely and a big so, one because I see uh, yeah. even the fact fashion uh, police have come around now we see for a lot of people it was even just the style of the glasses that was inhibiting them from going down that route but I see so many different options now uh, for people in terms of um, the blue blocking blue light blocking glasses that it's uh, it's great you see more and more and I see obviously more sports teams uh, using those which is great Um, quick question for you with the questionnaire now I see a lot of professional sports teams a lot of the monitors sleep devices are things that are prohibited on the uh, um, you know, as part of the athletes collective bargaining agreement. So something like a questionnaire, you know, as a proxy for these things seems like it could be very, uh, very powerful in terms of evaluating the quality of sleep, because I think it's something that I think athletes or general public would think if I don't, you know, if I fall asleep, okay, and get to the next morning, I must have had a good night's sleep. Um, but from what you're seeing, or the, the studies with even the blue light, that's not always the case, correct? Yeah, especially there was uh, there's one study that comes to mind that just looked at a 30 minute exposure of an iPad versus a paper book, and they found that there were changes in brainwave activity. So there was 
um, a reduction in slow wave sleep, which we know is the important stage where growth hormone is released, tissues are repaired. Like, this is a very important stage of sleep for athletes. Um, so even if you don't think that it's impacting you, it very well could be. And your suggestion is generally two hours before bed, uh, regardless of the bedtime, or is there a certain time at night that would be beneficial to, uh, to get those on? So if we have a normal sleep-wake schedule, um, to, our body starts to release melatonin, uh, increase in melatonin about two hours before bedtime. Mm-hmm. So that's why we would recommend um, the two hours before bedtime, regardless of, uh, I guess it's that it can work whenever you normally go to bed. And, and while we're on the topic of, um, you know, blue light blocking or things that we can do in the evening. Are there other strategies for sort of relaxing the nervous system or, or, or with lights in the house that you might uh, suggest as well for people in terms of that sleep environment? Definitely. So dimming the lights one, one hour before bedtime, it, it not only sends a cue to your body that, okay, now it's time to, to get ready for sleep, but it's also physiologically, um, you know, allowing that melatonin to come in. So, so having a good bedtime routine where, you know, maybe you do some relaxing activities, you take a bath um, or a shower and just have a routine, just like is, it's important for children to do. And we know that that can impact the amount of time, and, you know, it takes them to fall asleep. It's also important for adults as well. Um, also, you know, trying to activate that parasympathetic nervous system, so maybe some, some stretching or some relaxation techniques such as breathing can be very helpful uh, at helping prepare us to go to sleep. And so for people who like, I get a lot of clients who watch the news beforehand, you know, then maybe they get all riled up over the recent presidential elections in the U.S. Um, that, that type of thing, probably not so good then for preparing to sleep. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want any stimulating, alerting kind of activity. And I didn't mention too that the part of the problem with the electronic devices is the content that you're looking at as well. So it's not just about the blue light, it's about the content, which can be arousing and stimulating. And so for younger athletes, I mean, this is even, you know, various video games and things that are going to be more definitely stimulatory are things to consider as well, right? Yeah, so I would say maybe do that. Um, We normally say, you know, start your bedtime routine about an hour before bedtime. So, you know, you could possibly do the video games two hours before, but then once that hour mark hits, you set an alarm. So set a bedtime alarm to where, uh, let's say you normally go to bed at 10.30, have that alarm go off at 9.30, and that way you know, okay, now it's time for me to start my bedtime routine, put away the video games, put away the TV, um, you know, do relaxing activities to prepare the, the brain and body for sleep. I love that. I feel like it's great that we're, uh, even as adults, you know, we our bodies still function like we would be an infant or a toddler or a young child and that this routine is actually really highly beneficial for us even though we think we can kind of skip past it right exactly now as we shift over into even this idea of of napping now the common question i get is you know can you can you bank sleep can people go with six hours all week long and then i get my 12 hour sleep in on saturday and sunday and should i you know should i be good to go for the next week is that is that possible or is that just a pipe dream so I think if you're maintaining at least a normal level amount of sleep, and then if you increase that, and so let's say you normally need seven and a half hours of sleep per night. So if you're you're meeting that requirement, and then you have an important competition coming up where you know um, maybe the night before I'm not gonna sleep as well, you can definitely benefit, and the studies have shown that banking sleep can um, improve your performance. So there was a study done, it was um, a sleep deprivation study actually, where they showed they had one group, we told them, okay, let's have you get an hour more sleep leading the week leading up to this sleep deprivation period. And the other group, they said, just get your normal amount of sleep. And they found that the group that 
faint sleep actually performed a lot better during that sleep deprivation period. So it's important if you know that if you have something coming up where you know you're not going to be getting as much sleep, that uh, banking sleep can really be a benefit. And that's definitely on the front end then in terms of you know, getting that extra sleep before the big meeting, before the big competition versus not getting a lot of sleep and then the night before trying to get 10 hours or whatnot. Would that be Mm -hmm. a fair assessment? So, yeah. So in some of the sleep deprivation studies that I was working on, um, we would, one of the studies, we sleep deprived them for 36 hours, three times across the study, but we would have two days in between. And what we found is that even a 12 hour time in bed opportunity that after that 36 hour period was not enough for them to fully recover from that sleep deprivation. Gotcha. So if you do have, I mean, we all have situations where we know we're going to have, you know, come into a period where we're going to have sleep deprivation. Um, Trying to bank sleep heading into that is important. But then also maybe trying to extend sleep to help recover from that period can be useful as well. Terrific. Now on the napping front, is there a, you know, can you talk to us about timing of naps in terms of the length and duration? How long should the ideal nap be? Are there different times for different, uh, you know, whether it's cognitive function or athletic recovery? Yeah, so generally we see a circadian dip in our alertness and our levels of alertness between 1 and 3 p.m. So we would recommend trying to coincide the nap with that because it'll make it easier for you to fall asleep if you time it within your circadian dip. Um, So generally we say between 1 and 4 p.m. try and take a nap. And for our athletes, we recommend only a 20-minute nap on training days or days of competition because you don't get into that deeper stage of sleep where you're gonna wake up feeling groggy. Um, You should be able to take that 20 minute nap, set your alarm for 30 minutes to give yourself a little bit of time to fall asleep and then um, wake up feeling refreshed. And if you wake up before your alarm, get up, you know, as soon as you can. On the the non-competition days or on their days off, we would recommend more of a longer nap, so about a 90-minute nap. That way you're getting all the stages of sleep and you're also contributing positively to your sleep time across the week. So 90-minute naps on the days off is what we would recommend. That's great. And in terms of some of this new research that shows, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, so maybe you can shed some light for us. Um, This idea of having a coffee even before a nap seems to increase the alertness when you wake up but I guess my question is is it even you know do you still reap the benefits of the nap itself if you're caffeinating before uh, before the nap yeah actually uh, research has shown that that is kind of a new trend um, I've heard the term uh, nappuccino where you <laughs> nice you I like that <laughs> you caffeinate before the nap and I actually get a lot of questions on this for athletes uh, so I think it's pretty prevalent information out there but actually the research shows that you perform just as well if you don't take the caffeine and my concern would be if you're taking a nap at let's say 3 p.m. Um, and you take that caffeine prior to the nap, is that caffeine going to impact your nighttime sleep and your ability to fall asleep? So that's kind of my concern. Um, the later you take caffeine, the harder, you know, the longer it's in your bloodstream prior to sleep. Um, so I don't know. I think. I'm, I mean, I'm as a kind cl- of more of a fan of not taking the caffeine with the nap. If you keep the nap to 20 minutes, you're not going to have that issue of feeling groggy. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely one as a clinician. I say people are definitely over caffeinating typically in the afternoon to begin with um, and the impact on sleep and whatnot. So I'm always a little bit 
leery to be recommending adding more in in the afternoon when you know the nap seems to be sufficient itself uh, but that's great information there to add um, you know on competition days that 20 minute nap and and rest days 90 minutes now for somebody who's working in an office space like a uh, executives or entrepreneurs is that you know is a 20 minute nap going to be beneficial for them too in terms of just uh, you know cognitive function and, and being productive at work Exactly. So the research shows that those who nap are more productive than those who don't. And so that that includes executives and CEOs and high performing individuals that this nap is going to be beneficial for you. Um, a lot of people will say, I don't have time to nap. There's I there's no way for me to fit in a nap. But can you can you skip that uh, Starbucks run in the afternoon? I mean, the time it takes you to run and get a coffee is, you could be napping during that time. Um, can you maybe find some time during your lunch to find an area, a quiet space where you can try and um, nap? And it does take it does take practice. So it's not something that you can just do right away. Um, it will take practice. And having those relaxation techniques, those breathing techniques, uh, there's also this technique called cognitive shuffling, which I really like for even when if you have problems falling asleep, you think of a, a five letter word, so let's say, or a, not too long of a word, so let's say bedtime. And you, you imagine all of the objects that you can, starting with B, so ball, bag, baby, book. Once you fulfill, once you can't think of any more, you move on to E and you just imagine those random objects and move on to D. And before you get to the end of the word, you will be asleep. And it, it kind of simulates uh, what we're doing before we fall asleep. Oh, that's fantastic. I really like that. I'm going to try that tonight. Um, the, <laughs> the other piece with the naps I'd like to, like for me, do you, do you have to be horizontal? I mean, I always struggle uh, really falling asleep unless I'm lying down, but I could, you know, could someone in their chair sort of recline and close their eyes for 20 minutes? Would they still reap the benefits or did they have to be in a, sort of a sleep position? You want to be reclined. You don't have to be completely horizontal, but you it does help if you're in a reclined position. But you, yeah, you don't need like a couch or a bed necessarily. You could try, you know, in your chair or even, you know, slumped over on your desk. It, whatever you can do to uh, help and try and initiate the nap. I just, I have visions of that Seinfeld episode where George has a, you know, he takes a nap under his desk every day there. He's got a little alarm clock built in and everything so maybe that's not such a bad idea for a lot of people yeah um when i was in graduate school i actually had i had two kids during my five-year uh, phd masters and one of the i was so tired i was pregnant um so tired to sleep under my desk and there was one time when us kind of came into the room and was talking to my office mate and I hadn't fall, fallen asleep quite yet and I was just crossing my fingers and he wouldn't notice me sleeping under the desk. That's awesome. <laughs> that, that's so good. Now you touched on a few roadblocks for deep sleep. You mentioned um, obviously the blue light. We talked about caffeine in the afternoon. Uh, I know in a lot of my patients, uh, alcohol in the evening is definitely one, um, you know, modifying the intake. Now, what impacts do we see there on sleep? Because I have some clients who say, you know what, I have three glasses of wine and I sleep just fine. Um, you know, is there a threshold there? Is, is zero the best number? Can you get away with a, a glass of wine or a bottle of beer? I think it depends on the timing and the amount. So the earlier, the better. So if you, if you have one glass of wine with dinner, um, not going to be an issue, but if you have one glass of wine just before bed, it may impact your sleep. And what alcohol does is it, it helps us fall asleep quickly, but as it's being metabolized, it actually wakes us up even more. And another thing that it can do is it can, um, it can relax our airway and cause more sleep disorder breathing as well. So that's something to keep in mind. You may snore more, you may have more apneas kind of contributing to the poor quality of sleep when you are drinking. So I would say try to limit it to one drink per night and then to try and kind of cut that off as early as you can. 
That's uh, that's that's great advice and good to hear because I know a lot of my clients and uh, men, especially struggling with sleep apnea. I mean, that's a really common one of just the two or three drinks every single night. Um, and when we cut that back, things improve pretty steadily. And I, I really like that suggestion. And we know that you know as as we're metabolizing alcohol, you know, body temperature increases, and I imagine that's one of the indicators there for impacting the sleep effects um, but they have that idea of a front loading it a bit when you get home right from work or whatnot rather than waiting until you, you know you put the kids to bed or whatever it is you might be doing and then having that right before bed is is the is the wrong way to do it right yeah um, having kids myself I know how uh, nice it would be to just put the kids to bed have a glass of wine relax you know now that they're asleep um, but yeah it, for your sleep it's more beneficial to have it earlier gotcha now um, another one that we see a lot and this is with professional sports teams as well as collegiate teams and even you know again executives traveling is this effective air travel you know jet lag or having to cross time zones can you speak a little bit to the impacts on sleep and circadian rhythms and, and what people might be able to do to help combat that yeah what we're seeing in the research is that um pretty much probably about 50 percent and we're still kind of analyzing the results um have sleep disturbance during travel so it's very common for this to occur and the reason is because you know there's a mismatch between our internal rhythm and the destination time zone so if possible you want to try and prepare for that time zone shift ahead of time so for example if you're traveling west you want to start delaying your bedtime and try to go to sleep later and wake up later if you can. You wanna try and get light exposure in the evening, so um, in order to start delaying our circadian rhythm, and then also adjust your eating schedule as well, so start delaying your eating schedule, because we know that feeding is a potent regulator for our, our bot clocks as well. So um, delay, so if you're traveling west, delay sleep, um, sleep, wake, get light, late, and delay those feeding times. If you're traveling east, you want to do the opposite. So you want to start trying to go to bed earlier, wake up earlier, get light in the morning, and then try and um, shift your eating schedule to an earlier time as well. And that's a really nice, kind of easy win for a lot of people with the feeding because it's just great for people to know that if you're going one way or the other, you know, having that meal when you get there or holding off is actually a really great way to kind of get you back into or at least ease the transition of some of that jet lag as well as things like light exposure. So that's uh, that's great information. Um, yeah, so, um, so I didn't mention, so that was kind of in preparation for travel. Once you get at the destination, yeah, you definitely want to eat on the destination time zone. Gotcha. And you want to try and sleep on the destination time zone as best as you can. Gotcha. Now, there's, you know, if you fly to London in the UK, one of the airports there uh, has one of these mini hotels where, you know, you check in for like two or three hours. You've got this cubicle style room. You take a two or three hour nap and then you you get ready to attack the day. Is that that idea of kind of getting yourself back squared away if you're arriving at 530 or six in the morning? Is that something that would be beneficial or is it best to just to kind of caffeinate, eat and, and get on with your day? <laughs> Yeah, I guess it depends. It kind of depends on the timing um, of when you're arriving. Okay. Um, we recommend that you try and get as much sleep on the plane as possible. Um, and so if, let's say, you are arriving in London in the morning, it would it'd probably actually be advisable to just get on with your day, get that light exposure in the morning, just try and set your circadian rhythm to that time zone. Um, but it kind of depends on the situation. For sure. For sure. That's uh, good to know. I'll experiment with that on my next trip. Um, now, shifting gears a little bit to this idea you mentioned in terms of the total uh, sleep time being between that seven to nine hours is kind of the, the sweet spot. Now, how do we, is there any way for us to know, you know, is it seven and a half for me or eight and a half for that person? How do we, how can we roughly put our finger on it? And is there a way in a lab to, to really nail it down? Yeah, so I think um, trying to measure your sleep time when you don't have any constraints, so maybe on a vacation when you don't necessarily have to get up for work and those kind of things and kind of experimenting with that, you know, 
is this amount of sleep working for me? Um, if you're waking up without an alarm clock, that's a good sign. If you're waking up feeling refreshed within 30 minutes, that's also a good sign that you're getting the proper amount of sleep. There are a lot of people out there that think that they can get by on, you know, six hours or less of sleep per night. But what we see is that there's only less than 3% of the population who are true short sleepers. The rest, the rest of the people, um, they're just not getting sufficient sleep and their decision making, their mood, all of that is impacted even if they don't realize it. And is it true that a you know, a large percentage of those people who only need a small amount of sleep are actually, you know, CEOs and and leaders and things like that. I've, I've heard that sort of rumor that they have those extra hours in the day and they don't get impacted like the rest of us with this lack of sleep. Have you heard any of that or is that just a... Uh... I actually just read an article today about this executive who averages 9.25 hours of sleep per night and he owns three multi-million dollar companies wow um, so so you don't yeah, you don't have to be sleep deprived to be a to be a no, powerful ceo okay i don't know perfect um terrific i mean is there you know coming back to the to the athletes here um you know basketball players you know in particular as that's my uh, domain um we see in the you know the nba a lot of back to back so flying overnight and then quick sleep in the day after you know they play on a Friday night let's say and then you fly overnight you land and then you're playing again on Saturday um, that type of lack of sleep and and then playing and performing you touched on things like reaction time can you can you speak to that a little bit more of the things that might occur for the athletes in terms of performance yeah so um, there was actually a study at Stanford looking specifically in college basketball players and what they found was that with sleep extension, um, reaction times improved, shooting percentage improved, so both free throw and three point percentage improved, and sprint times improved, um, as well as mood. So they felt better, they felt more refreshed, they felt had more energy and those kind of things. So it can certainly impact your um, performance. There's actually a model uh, a model looking at the NBA team specifically um, showing that they can kind of predict when teams will lose based on the back-to-backs that they've had so if they've had a number of games in a row if they are traveling away you know have short time for rest those kind of things and they take all of those things into consideration and can kind of predict these red alert games is what they call them and and show that those teams are more at risk when they don't have as much rest and are yeah basically don't have as much rest i mean that's massive isn't it i mean reaction time free throw percentage three point percentage sprint time i mean these are these are pretty uh, valuable things in terms of uh winning games in a basketball game and nba game so it's amazing how that focus on sleep as not only a recovery aid but obviously a in the back end of performance aid as well right it's pretty uh pretty significant yeah it's a, it's a pretty uh, potent performance enhancing tool that's great now anything else in there in the research that you're doing that that st- stands out um that, that you wanted to share or things that you're seeing with the uh, canadian national athletes um i mean we're we're just showing we're trying to kind of replicate the stanford study um, looking at sleep at baseline, and we've studied curlers, rowers. We're currently working with speed skaters right now. So looking at their baseline sleep, and then putting in these interventions, which we know athletes are lacking, um, and then seeing how that impacts their sleep and performance on the other end. So we're still kind of in the process of analyzing that. But overall, we found with the three interventions of sleep time, napping, and blue blocking that overall um, they report less fatigue during those sleep interventions. They report more energy. They have less muscle soreness. Um, and so, you know, showing that uh, athletes likely need more sleep and that these interventions can be helpful at improving their sleep quality and quantity. 
Wow, yeah, that's 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 phenomenal. Um, just as we wrap up here, the last couple questions uh, in terms of things like supplements, are there things that you guys have experimented with or things that even just um, anecdotally you think might be supportive? I know, you know, things like magnesium glycinate or people using various herbs or melatonins to help with uh, sleep. Any, any thoughts there on, on which populations that might be beneficial for? Yeah, so for us, we do ask the question, you know, are you taking any kind of sleep aid to help you sleep? Um, and for us, it's more of a red flag. So we, when we see someone saying that they're taking melatonin, it's kind of a red flag for us that, you know, maybe they're not getting the best quality sleep that they can. Maybe there's an underlying sleep disorder of insomnia. Um, so we don't necessarily recommend um, supplementation. Mm -hmm. I would say the re one of the the best supplements I guess that I've seen out there is with tart cherry juice um, yep. actually helps increase melatonin and reduces inflammation and that kind of thing so um, that might be useful to try um, but if if you do have athletes or with you know other li listeners out there that are struggling with their sleep in some way to definitely seek help from a sleep professional don't just live with it your entire life there's there's things that we can do to help treat um the sleep problems yeah i think that's absolutely great because um you know things like the the all the lifestyle stuff around exposure and, and circadian rhythm and for me it's a big red flag as well with young athletes you know especially collegiate or high school taking melatonin already this is just uh, you know totally inappropriate in terms of you know just a band-aid approach and not really getting to the root of why you know either taking away the causing inputs there of all that blue light exposure at night or or really getting to the root cause yeah. of it so i think that's great advice yeah i totally agree yeah and the last question I have for you is actually, can you walk us through, you know, what's your sort of sleep routine or what are some of the things that, uh, you know, in your house, how many hours of sleep do you get or what kind of stuff do you do for your sleep hygiene? So yeah, I try it at 9.30. So I try to go to bed at 10.30. So at 9.30, I try and put away the devices. Um, I might prepare myself for the next day. So I might maybe pick out clothes, maybe get my lunch ready, that kind of thing. Um, and then just do a relaxing activity. So take a shower, maybe read a book if I need to. And then right before I go to sleep, I try and do some breathing techniques. So I do a technique called 478 breathing. So you breathe in for four seconds, you hold your breath for seven, and you breathe out for eight. And this is supposed to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, helps you relax. And then I do probably about a series of 10 just deep breaths in and out. And then if I'm really struggling to fall asleep, I'll, um, I'll do the cognitive shuffle. So that'll help you fall asleep. Oh, I didn't mention that I do use the blue blocking glasses um, in the two hours before bedtime as well. Awesome. Those are all fantastic uh, suggestions and uh, you must sleep pretty well then through the night, no? <laughs> well, I have kids that- <laughs> It's always the X factor, right? Yeah, I have a daughter who's two and my son's four and um, there's very few times where I can just sleep a solid, you know, nine hours of sleep without uh, them interrupting. But I guess, sure. I guess that's the way it goes. Exactly right. Uh, fantastic. Well, thanks so much for taking the time out uh, today, Dr. Amy. Where can people uh, get a hold of you or get access to some of your research? Is there a best place on the interwebs to connect with you? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter uh, at Sleep for Sport. It's the number four. Um, and then I'm also linked to Center for Sleep. So on my Twitter, you can access Center for Sleep, who um, has a Twitter account and social media as far as just finding ways to optimize your sleep just for the general public. Um, yeah, those are the two main ways. And then I'm 